the first one, the first one will be handed. So good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. I also want to extend my gratitude to the organizers of the Script Road Festival of, because they included us as architects and urban planners and the people related to history to talk a little bit about the river, about the relation between cities and the river. Uh, so important, uh, so was so important in the past and also important now in the present. We have people here from different uh, countries, from different origins, all of them with experience about cities, about rivers in the past, and we will speak also about the future. So uh, I'll pass the floor to Dr. Salus Marques, just to introduce, he's the actual president of uh, Institute um, of uh, European Institute of Macau, former president of the City Hall of Macau, so he has a deep knowledge about the city and about the history and about the planning and urban planning and so on. So I'll pass the floor to him. He will be the moderator of the first part. Uh, we will have two guest speakers and I will be the moderator of the second part. So welcome and we are going to start now. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, first of all, and uh, also uh, it's a privilege to be uh, here today uh, at the uh, Script Road. And uh, I would like to start right away uh, by introducing the first speaker, uh, which is uh, Robert Anthony, the doctorate in history and currently distinguished professor and senior research researcher at the Canton 13 Hongs Research Center. It sounds very nice, actually, at Guangzhou University. His research focuses on China's social, legal, and maritime history. And he is going to talk about pirates of Macau in story, historical perspective. So please take the floor, uh, Robert. Ready? Okay. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you. And thank the organizers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, again, it's really nice to be here and give me this opportunity. I've, uh, my wife and I lived in Macau, and still part of Macau, I guess, for over 10 years. I uh, taught at the University of Macau for that, that many years as well. Now I um, moved upriver to another river city in uh, Guangzhou. Um, 
and where I'm a researcher at the Guangzhou University. And um, so as you can see, my talk is going to be a little bit about pirates. Um, maybe this is not the kind of thing that you think about when you're talking about the city and uh, uh, other aspects of uh, Macau life and so on. But uh, I think Macau is, uh, uh, piracy is very important. Uh, one of the very important aspects about uh, the history and the development of, uh, of this area. So in way of introduction, I'm going to start by uh, reading something. Um, this is a, first there's a case that I came across in the uh, Macau archives relating to a pirate by the name of uh, Zhang Rongsheng. And he was operating here in the Macau area in 1830. And uh, he was not one of the lucky pirates that got away with it. He was captured and then uh, executed uh, by the uh, government, the Qing government, not, by, not in Macau, but the, by the Qing government in China in 1830. Uh, but before he was executed, he uh, gave a confession about uh, a little bit about what he had done. And I thought this was an interesting way to get started. So I'll, let me just read his, uh, his confession after being captured by the government. So this is what he said. I am 34 years old, a native of Guishan County, that's in Guangdong. Uh, both my parents are dead, and I have no brothers. I'm married to a woman named Zheng. Normally, I'm a hired worker on a boat. But last year, that was 1829, in the seventh lunar month, I came to Macau and am now out of work. On the 16th day of this month, that's the first lunar month of 1830, an acquaintance named Dou Pi Guang, uh, whose surname I don't know, came to Xinhui County where I met him. He told me how to get rich, and I agreed. We afterwards ran into uh, uh, Ya Hei Zai, and Liu Yahai, who had a small boat. On board were seven sailors, Morlo, uh, Yajang, Yalio, and five others. I don't know their names. And there were also three Western devils and one black devil. We had about 15 men. On board the boat were rattan shields, knives, and other weapons. On the 16th, we set out in a boat and arrived at Shudzimen, that's the cross gate, where we spotted a foreign sandpan in the distance along the shoals, transporting goods. We began to follow it. Then on the 19th or the 20th, I don't remember, we arrived at sea eastward of Lingdong. Uh, we now drew in very close to that sandpan. That uh, Dou Pi Guang, Liu Yahai, and Ya Hei Zai grabbed the rattan seals, shields. I picked up a knife and that black devil and Morlo uh, and the other sailors also picked up knives and weapons and we boarded the victim's boat. There were six foreigners and one Chinese aboard the sandpan. After killing them, we threw them into the sea. The sandpan, in the sandpan's hold were two small cannons, but we didn't remove them. We then sailed our small boat back to Nanwan, where we anchored. The three foreign devils on board our boat got seven boxes of opium as, uh, from the loot. I and the other 11 Chinese got seven boxes of opium. I and the other Chinese divided our seven boxes into 18 shares. Each share weighed 40 jin of opium. I got one share of 40 jin. I gave my share to Dou Pi uh, Guang and the Zhuzhou uh, and uh, asked them also to sell it for me. Besides, the, uh, he also goes into talking about the other uh, pirates on his boat. Uh, he said they were all, uh, knew some of them, knew some of them by their names. He also uh, knew though that the, the Chinese were Tonka, that is a Chinese fishermen. Some of them were from Macau, he said. Well, I use this to get into the talk because I think it shows you several things about uh, pirates and a little bit about Macau. Uh, first, what can we learn about pirates from this case? Uh, the first thing I think we can say is that although often we think of pirates in these big gangs, you know, uh, large-scale piracy, 
In reality, most pirates were small timers in small gangs. The second thing is that most of these pirates were very poor and very mobile people. They were mostly fishermen and mostly sailors, often unemployed or very uh, seldom employed, you could say, or made very little money. They were very poor. Also included in here uh, would be people who came from not only China, not only Chinese pirates, but we can see some of these gangs were made up of a mix of people, both Chinese and uh, foreigners. So in this case, we see that there are several foreign devils, he called them, and also a black devil. He doesn't go into any details as to who they were, because he probably didn't know their names. But he knew that they were foreigners, and one was black. We can also see from this case that many of these people who became pirates were only part-time pirates, in a way, and they were relatively young, mostly in their 20s and 30s. We can also learn some things about Macau. Macau we think of as an interesting city, a unique place that was uh, conducive to harmonizing East and West. But there's also, I would say, a kind of dark side to Macau's history, and the pirates, in a way, represent this other side of Macau's history. So, whoops. When we read about Macau, one of the first things that probably all of us have read was that uh, Macau's founding by the Portuguese had something to do with pirates. Sometime in the 1550s, the Portuguese came to this area around Macau where they uh, supposedly then, according to stories we hear, they put down the pirates in this area and were rewarded to some extent by the government, the Chinese government granting them access, allowing them to live here in Macau. Yet at the same time, we can look at Chinese sources. Instead of being... Uh, defenders against pirates or fighting against pirates, some of the Chinese sources take an opposite view and say that the Portuguese were actually pirates themselves, that they kidnapped ch women and children and sold them into slavery. Well, in reality, I would say that there's a little bit of truth to both stories. But what is for certain is that piracy had an intimate relationship with Macau's history and with the development of Macau as a river city, as a port city. Much of this reason has to do with the geography of this area. Around Macau, we can see many of the peninsula of Macau, where we are right now, but there are also many islands. The whole area of the Pearl River Delta and the coastal area nearby along the Guangdong coast are peppered with many many islands, very, very small ones, some relatively large, but mostly really small islands. Here in this area, of course, there's Kolowan and Taipa. And if you look elsewhere, there's a Hongqin, a Da Hongqin, a Greater Hongqin and Small Hongqin. Now it's all one Hongqin, though. And uh, then there are many other little islands all along the coast. We can think of this area as a kind of veritable maritime frontier, a water frontier that was open. Although the Chinese government claimed many of these areas as belonging to them, the Portuguese also had claims to some of these areas. Neither the Portuguese or the Chinese governments had really any control over these outer islands along the coast or in this Pearl River estuary. These were more like no man lands in many areas. And this also led to another problem. Who has jurisdiction over these areas? Was it the Chinese government that claimed jurisdiction, that claimed to control these areas? Or was it something else? Was it the Portuguese that were going to control these areas? So there was always an issue of sovereignty relating to these islands, such as Kolowan and to uh, Taipa but also Hongqin Islands and Lapa and other areas right here in this, this delta area, very close to where we are now in Macau. Well, 
Well, as I said in the beginning, the, Macau has a long history with piracy. Although probably the earliest pirates date back to ancient times, long before the Portuguese ever came here. And these would have been mostly Chinese pirates. The earliest written records we have of piracy in this area only date from the Mongol period, from the Yuan Dynasty. And the first uh, pirate that we have a, a good record about is this man up here named Huang Yi in the early 14th century. This is the Mongol period. And uh, he was uh, a pirate that operated around this area in one of these, uh, several of the islands, actually in the uh, Hongqin. He had his pirate base in Hongqin, uh, right across the, from here, from Macau. Um, then during the, uh, the Ming and Qing period, piracy actually stepped up. There was a large number of different pirates in this area. Probably the most famous of these pirates was Zhang Baozai. He operated in the Pearl River Delta and along the Guangdong coast during the uh, late 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. He came to uh, control a large pirate fleet consisting of perhaps as many as 20,000 pirates, including men and women. Zhang Baozai also suddenly retired from the pirate business. He surrendered in 1810 to the Qing government and was soon afterwards rewarded with an uh, appointment as a military official, sent out then to suppress his former colleagues, those pirates that he had worked with for so many years. Now, although large-scale piracy ended with Zhang Baozai in 1810, that doesn't mean that piracy in this area ended. There were lots of more of these petty pirates, small-scale pirates, and occasionally large-scale pirates with pirate fleets numbering up into a thousand men. Most of the attacks that the pirates had were against Chinese ships, mostly small ships, mostly fishing vessels or small cargo vessels. Occasionally, though, the, Chi uh, the, the uh, Chinese pirates would attack Western ships, but very rarely would they do this because they were usually better armed. In 1854, I think it was, 1854, pirates not too far away from Macau attacked a South American, a Chilean schooner by the name, the ship was called Caldera. Okay, the Caldera. And this was, uh, aboard the ship was a, a French woman named Fanny Loviat. And she wrote a very interesting story, a book, about her adventures being captured and held prisoner by these pirates. Her book is called, in English translation, it was translated into English and published in 1859, A Lady's Captivity Among Chinese Pirates. Very interesting book about her and her exploits there and what happened to her with these Chinese pirates. But there were not only Chinese pirates operating in this area after the Opium War. There were also foreigners, including many Americans, some Europeans, including Portuguese, many Southeast Asians, some Africans, like the story I mentioned, there was a, a black man, the black devil. We don't know, maybe he was an African slave or maybe he came from India, we don't know for sure. Uh, also these Manila men, Manila men in general referred to people who came from Southeast Asia, not necessarily only from the uh, Philippines, but also from other areas of Southeast Asia. They were called lumped together as Manila men. They often uh, formed gangs of their own. And sometimes they joined, like the uh, first case I gave, joined gangs of Chinese pirates to attack ships and boats, attack villages along the coast, right here in this area. There are also stories of Portuguese pirates who got involved with uh, uh, their own gangs and also connection with the, okay, got in connection with other Chinese pirates and sometimes they were doing 
even uh, these, these Portuguese sailors formed convoys that were supposed to be protecting the uh, area against pirates. Instead, they also joined in, in a sense, and attacked other boats, uh, and they became even worse than some of the pirates themselves. Okay, maybe quickly go along. Of course, there were not only men pirates, I mentioned that there were female pirates. Two of the most famous female pirates operating out of Macau in this area, one was uh, in the time of Zhang Baozai, uh, Shi Shanggu, or better known as Zheng Yi Sao, the wife of Zheng Yi. And uh, she was a Tonka prostitute who joined the ranks of the pirates. And later on, after her husband died, Zheng Yi, after he died in 1807, she took control of his fleet and became a very strong pirate woman herself. Eventually, she also retired in 1810 when the pirates all surrendered, and she took up residence here in Macau for a time, and uh, where she was supposedly opened up an opium den and uh, a gambling parlor. And she lived in the area in, uh, in Putonghua, it's called Shalito, in this area right around here. Another pirate lady, Lai Choi San, was given the nickname the Queen of Macau Pirates. And she was very active in this area in the early 1920s, 1930s. She was born into a pirate family. Her father was a pirate chief that controlled mo much of the fishing industry here in Macau in the early part of the 20th century. Later on, uh, when her father died, she took control of the family business. And she also then lived here, had houses here, was considered to be quite wealthy. She also had connection with Macau government. She was protected by influential people, let us say, here in Macau. Both of these uh, pirate women have been romanticized we can see in the first slide there is a movie about Zhang Baozai and about uh, Zheng Yi Sao, the pirate queen, I mean, the pirate, uh, the, the first one I mentioned. And the other ones, uh, how many of you may know the cartoon, Pir uh, Terry and the Pirate, in the 1930s, 1940s. This was actually based on Lai Choi San. She became the epitome of the uh, dragon lady. And here we have something from a kind of a, a men's journal in the United States that also depicts the pirate queen in the China Seas. Finally, last thing I'll say is something about Kolowan. Um, Kolowan was a pirate base for many years, long before, probably long before the Portuguese ever came here, and remained the pirate area well into the early 20th century. In 1910, there was a very famous case that grabbed international attention. A group of pirates in Kolowan <clears throat> kidnapped about 20 children, uh, Chinese children, and brought them to Kolowan where they were holding them for, for a ransom, for payment. The Portuguese got wind of this, the Portuguese government here in Macau got wind of this, and sent the uh, warships and soldiers to Kolowan to suppress the pirates in the, in the summer, in July of 1910. After some uh, bitter fighting between the so-called pirates and the uh, Portuguese forces, the pirates were so-called uh, defeated. <clears throat> These are some slides of some of the people who were captured. And of course, you can see they just look like ordinary fishermen and sailors or lo local residents. And in fact, the locals, even to today, when we interview some of the locals, that uh, older people that remember some of this or ho heard stories of this, they don't think of this as a great victory for the Portuguese over the pirates. Instead, they see this as a massacre of innocent women and children in Kolowan. Nonetheless, <clears throat> After the victory, if you want to call it a victory in, of the Portuguese forces against the uh, pirates in, Maca in Kolowan, they built a monument that's still there in front of St. Xavier Church. It still stands there. And July 13th, the day, one of the days of the battles that the Portuguese forces supposedly won, 
July 13th became a, you could say, a national holiday in Macau and was celebrated well into 1950. And here's a picture of 1950 celebrating this national day or this holiday, this great holiday of the victory of the uh, Portuguese over the pirates. And you can see officials standing in the background in their white uniforms. And maybe you can see in the front foreground there are Chinese and so on. This is the monument that still stands there in Kolowan. If you go there, you'll see it in front of St. Francis Xavier's church. Well, just a brief conclusion. The decline of piracy, we can see this today. There aren't very big problems with piracy in this area anymore. But 40 or 50 years ago, piracy was still something we see here in the uh, Canton Delta. Ferries that went back and forth between Hong Kong and Macau just 50 years ago took four hours. Those ferries had to be protected. The uh, captain's cabin at the top where the steerage is were protected by iron grills. The ferries were also protected with sepoy guards who carried Winchester rifles. Although piracy dis disappeared in this area, we can still see that they have lived on in times of legends and stories and in books. I put this one up here. This is, um, everyone's probably heard of Marlon Brando, the famous American actor, godfather, right? Uh, he wrote a book about uh, the Queen of Macau, the pirates, and it's called Fantan. Let me stop with that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. This was an extraordinary uh, presentation. Uh, some of this uh, uh, slides that you have over there uh, and the uh, posters, I have to say, i never seen them before, actually. I didn't know that it was, uh, there was a cartoon in the States about uh, pirates in South China Sea and around Macau. Well, I'm going to as uh, our next speaker is uh, Kenneth Wong. Uh, he's an academic and social entrepreneur in the area of urban planning and cultural landscape. And he has recently been invited to re-enhance re the tourism sector of Sunderbanks, Kolkata, together with his peers in ICTC, International Cultural Tourism Committee. So uh, please uh, take the floor, Kenneth. And at the end of this, uh, presentation, we will sit down together again, and uh, there will be a, uh, the floor will be open for questions and uh, discussions for around 10 minutes. So please, uh, Kenneth, you can start. Thank you. Can somebody help to make it full screen? <laughs> a bit mysterious. Uh, good evening, everyone, because the title is missing. Um, actually, the title is just around the river bend. I will explain later um, at the end of the presentation why I name it as just around the river bend. And I will touch on the cities of Ipoh, Malacca, and also Kuala Lumpur. Just show a hand if you've been to these three cities in Malaysia. Okay, good. Thanks for the invitation um, of the Script Root Festival and also Maria as well. I met Maria during my trip uh, in e-commerce India, in Kolkata, uh, during December last year. Um, and probably this is the only slide that sounds a bit poetic. And uh, while I read through the articles, I found that to see river as a subject actually is very accommodating regardless what uh, kind of uh, baggage or emotional chunks they've thrown into the river, the river can still accommodate it. And true enough, our civilization of the human 
um, it's all tightly related to river. Yeah. And for Malaysia, uh, most of the time it tied up to the tin mining economic activity. Because of the tin mining, then my ancestor came from China to Malaysia and then to become a tin miners. That's why I'm the third generation in Malaysia. So you can see that even Malaysia is evolved from rural economy, agriculture, tin mining, manufacture, and by 2020, we will live into the developed country, hopefully. And then from the rural, we also have our oil palm cultivation as well. And river basins is always an issue because if you have a palm land, most of the time you have uh, pollution issues as well. And this is Ipo during the olden times and uh, the current scenario right now. So, uh, Kinta River is where the Ipo as the capital of the Para state right now. Um, the previous capital is in Taiping, but it only moved to Ipo because of the tin mining. And after the tin mining elapsed, uh, due to the industry uh, demand is not there anymore, then we have these uh, swiftlet hotels, just like some of the abandoned shop houses become a property for the Swiftlet hotel industry. And I used to advise the uh, local government to look into Kinta Valley itself as a cultural landscape because uh, most of the settlement flourish because of the Kinta River. We have a different small town along Kinta River like Papan, Kampa, Ipo, uh, Gopeng and etc. And you can also see some of the social and cultural uh, marks as well. Like um, the tin mining um, technology actually is imported by European officers. So you can see the symmetry by the European officers on one side of the town, and then the other side is the uh, Chinese tin miners. And I just want to highlight some of the legislation that are related to the heritage conservation in Malaysia. Um, because back then, uh, it's not inclusive of the cultural or intangible cultural aspect side. So it highlights that the historical, uh, to tie up with the cultural landscape that I just mentioned, um, then we emphasize on the historical importance, association, relationship with the Malaysian history, the social and cultural associations, and the potential to educate the next generation, what it used to be. Like right now, the state government already opened up the last tin mining dredging machine in Tanjong Tuolang. Uh, it's manufactured in uh, UK back then, and then assembled only in Malaysia, in Malaya at that time. And also to protect this kind of uh, industrial heritage, we have certain statutory uh, act in place, actually. And then this is Kinta Valley. Uh, it's a book published by Erika Books. Most of the um, history-related books is by this publishing company in Malaysia, which is very well done. And then uh, this is some of the abstracts that I abstracted from the articles that I read from this book. So the Kinta River was narrow, tortuous, and almost impassable in some parts. Each year, the Para administration incurred a great expense in keeping the Kinta River navigate. And for some reason, uh, Taiping uh, is always act as a municipal, the capital, rather than Ipoh, because it's not self-aware due to the flood issues. And river, as we know, is more of a transportation for the goods as well, the timber, logging, and etc. 
And then when the Chinese immigrants come over, then they are sort of spread around the different villages along the Kinta River. And then we have the first um, railway station in Portville, which is close to the river mouth. And then the Kinta, Kinta River is close to the Tolo Intan as another port. So you can see the relationship between the uh, railway station, river, river mouth, and the port. And it just showed that uh, during the olden days, there's a bull cart uh, used and also elephant as well. And for European officers to survive in the tropical country, then uh, it's a good place to cool down themselves as well. And even our Raja Yusuf, he can catch the turtles back then. So now we move to Kuala Lumpur. It's the capital of the Malaysia. It's a confluence of two rivers. And um, Yap Aloy is the first, is the third captain actually who oversee and manage well the Kuala Lumpur. And that's why uh, it flourished thanks to him actually. And uh, in Hakka word, Lampang means muddy, uncleared forest. So there are three speculation about how this name come from. And then the swampy land is beside the Gomba and the Klan River. And the picture just now show, the, show you that it's a confluence of these two rivers. And Lumpur means muddy, actually. And in Malay language, uh, a smaller stream joins a larger one. It's usually called the Kuala of the smaller stream. So that's why this, there's one Sungai Lumpur, they're joining the Sungai Klang. But, uh, it's very bizarre, uh, buzz, uh, bizarre in the sense that why use a junction instead of a mainstream per se? And then the third version is that um, it's a Pengkalan Lumpur, means Mari Jetty. Yeah. And after a while, it wolf to Kalan Lumpur, then it become Kuala Lumpur. So this just show you the map and the location of the Klang River that eventually flow out to uh, Malacca Straits. And um, if you know Emeril Cheng Ho ever uh, come to Malacca, and during that time, the Klang is already mentioned in the ancient map. And during uh, 1820s, there are 20 villages uh, with the total population of 1,005 along the uh, river Klang. And mainly more of them come from Malay in Sumatra as well. And of course, with the tin mining, then they bring in the Chinese laborers. And this just mentions some of the incident, like malaria was quite uh, common during back then. And then because um, river used to be a transportation mode, so of course, from the river mouth of Klang travel to Kuala Lumpur, it takes four days. So imagine uh, this is also the only channel that um, transport the tin. So there's this Slango Civil War which uh, involved the two gangs of uh, tin miners. One is Gihin, another one is Haisan with a different dialect group. And then um, we have this British resident general who came in and uh, intervened and resolved the conflicts, per se. And then when he took, when he managed power the situation, he somehow feel that Kuala Lumpur is much better uh, as a candidate for capital compared to Klang. That's why since then, then Kuala Lumpur become the capital. And also in 1890s, uh, the population is already grown up to 20,000. Um, any of you heard about the River of Light project in Kuala Lumpur? Okay, it just uh, freshly announced in uh, August last year. So it's a mega project, cost million. So I'll just show you some of the 
uh, scenario of the pollution and the rubbish trap uh, along the Klang River. So you see the upstream is very clean, then the, the downstream is like a monsoon canal. So that's why it's kind of a detachment to the river because we hardly see in river. We always assume it is like a monsoon drain. It's no longer a river. Yeah. yeah that's why people call it big drain. Yeah. You, can, you can get killed if you fall into that. So it's quite a, a waste for an asset because um, we should be more closer to the waterfront and riverfront rather than see it as something not relevant to your daily life. And then somehow later on, there's some graffiti as well, which is a good approach. So now this is the current product with some uh, blue uh, neon light illumination. And um, Aircom is the architecture company who oversees this project. So, and then the EcoWaste is a developer. It said that uh, it will gain nine billion as a return of this completion of a million project uh, by 2020. So now it's an 80 percent completion, and then uh, as you see from the picture there is a same location as I show you the confluence of the rivers. And then during the uh, construction time, then they excavate accidentally uh, about 45 gravestones, whereby it can date back almost uh, 200 years back. Of course, they um, raise some of the attention of the archaeologists and uh, heritage experts as well. So um, it's not a surprise because it used to be a Muslim cemetery of the uh, population settlement called uh, Kampung Rawa. And they are mostly Malays from Rawa Mandaling, Minangkabau, Javanese, and Bugis tribe from Sumatra. And these are just some of the remarks from the news clip that I come across this uh, reporting. So it say that, um, because it's their residence, people die, and naturally, the dead body will be buried in front of the house, actually. And those tombs were found, they can find the deaths that be engraved on the tomb. And then Malay um, settles at the northern side of the Klang River, while Chinese settle at the southern part. So um, then, of course, there's a discussion about it should be protected under the Antiquities Act and etc. Now we move on to Malacca, uh, which I think most interested for a fellow Portuguese here. Um, so it's a meeting point of East and West. Uh, Portuguese ever came here uh, for 3G. They call it uh, glory, God, and gold. Yeah. <laughs> of course, later on, then they have a followers of uh, Dutch and also uh, British as well. So this is the olden days and the current time. So it has the population of around 2000 in 1403. Uh, during the time, there's no king per se, and uh, it create a trade route between India, China, and Indonesia. And also, the so early Malay seek kind of um, protection from they, they would rather not to seek it from Siam, but from China as well. That's why we have the Cheng Ho that came over here. And we also have a Chinese population. Uh, that's why we have this Mazu, sort of uh, the Sea of God temple that you can find in Malacca. And because of the different tribes and races, then you will see some of the assimilation of the architecture building style uh, in one single individual uh, building. 
And then this just show you that um, whatever is within the fort is a Portuguese or Dutch uh, settlement, while the one at the open area is always the local settlement. Uh, of course, Portuguese never put Malacca as a main focus because it's just like an entry point for them to go to other spice islands like Maluku as well. And by 1550, the profit from trade in Malacca amounted to four times Portugal internal revenue. So the colonial states are doing better than the mother country. And then later on, uh, it lose to Spain. Um, then it lose the power in Southeast Asia as well. So before the Portuguese conquest, as I mentioned, they are Malay, so they are Javanese uh, merchants as well. And also they are clean traders. Uh, this is the way that we describe the, the slave or labor from India back then. There's a clean settlement as well. And then um, this one maybe is interested to you, uh, interesting to you, Just called five minutes, Gudang. Please. Yeah, okay. So it's kind of uh, storage, the goods from the fire, Gudang on the second paragraph. And then um, we have a beautification of the canal, and then you can see some of the structure is still there, like the river edge steps, the antique rings, and also the old crane. And then this just show you different phases or the incidents uh, happen uh, in the different period of the time of uh, history. And then this is what you see now as a tourist to go along the river with a nice boat. And then this is just the Javanese uh, settlement that I mentioned, the Kampong Jawa. So before the beautification, of course, the comments is about dirty, awful, smelly, it's a prostitute and a drugs addicts area. And then, but still, even though after the beautification, some, some of the individual houses still uh, untack, which I prefer in this way, so that it's not become a kind of a, a Disneyland kind of a, a appearance, per se. So this is just some of the scientific approach about the impacts of the beautification and then some of the feedbacks from the residents. So among the good practices is that um, they recycle the original electric stones from the Dutch area that have fallen into the river over the centuries. And also, they want to showcase that this is a public architecture that belongs to the people. Uh, of course, our future direction is always about being resilient in responding to the um, sustainable development goal under the United Nations. So, as I mentioned, my, my title at the first slide is um, just around the river bend. Um, throughout the human civilization, if you take the wrong egg, it will lead to a disaster. But probably river can accommodate it. But as um, global citizen, we probably should be more um, cautious because the mega project is coming over to Pearl River Delta as well. Yeah. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Caleb. Yes, please uh, don't leave us. <laughs> Just keep on, uh, City. Thank you very much for presenting us uh, your point of view and your experiences and uh, case studies on uh, Malaysia. Actually, you bridge history with, uh, with present, the present times uh, with, your, uh, with your conclusions and the projects that you presented. And, uh, and I think uh, somehow we just also opened the door for the, for the next panel, which is about strategies. Anyway, we have uh, 10 minutes, something like that, according to Maria, 10 minutes, okay? Uh, for questions or for... Uh, any comments, which I would request uh, the, the audience to make it as brief as possible. Uh, so the floor is open for questions and uh, comments, please. Well, yes, please.
Okay, uh, I would like to congratulate both uh, speakers. Very interesting. I would like to focus on the first uh, on the first um, presentation, and uh, I'd like to briefly ask two questions. In the overall terms about uh, history of piracy in Macau, with related to the ec economic outcome of the of this practice. How do you understand it? Was it beneficial for Macau or was it a disadvantage for Macau? So this is the first question. Second question, and uh, taking this activity that uh, you, you focused that was uh, extended throughout centuries, uh, with regard to, to the consequences on the urban shape, uh, we know and we are aware of, of the, uh, the fortifications that were built, some of them already demolished, like in, uh, in uh, Nawan, the, the St. Peter's uh, fortress. Um, were there any relevant um, outcome, were there any relevant other buildings rather than the fortifications that were built to uh, a, a cope with the piracy activity here in Macau? or is something that you cannot find further to the fortress? Thank you. Um, let me answer the second part, the second question about the uh, fortifications and uh, other kinds of structures that the government would have built here in Macau. Um, I'm mostly familiar with the ones in Taipa. There was a fort built in Taipa and then also in Kolawan. There were also uh, barracks and soldiers uh, placed in both areas. And uh, to mainly, the, at least the reason given for building the forts in Taipa and Kolawan were to protect the areas from pirates. Um, other than that, um, we can see that many of these places that had the, that, that the fortifications were, were put up were not that... Uh, Effective, I guess you could say. They didn't, they didn't really stop the pirates or piracy. Um, and for the first question about the economics of piracy, um, the answer is yes and no. Um, first, I could say if you're a victim, uh, piracy hurts you economically because they robbed your ship, maybe killed you, wounded people, destroyed your cargo, or stole your cargo. On the other hand, though, uh, what we can see happening was the development of a shadow economy that went alongside the irregular economy that the pirates, smugglers, and other kinds of uh, clandestine people operated. So in this sense, it also helped, to some extent, the econ economic development in Macau. Alongside with uh, piracy and smuggling, of course, there's the opium trade here in Macau and so on. So all of these were semi-legal or illegal activities that are intimately tied to the economy of Macau and Macau's development. Thank you. So further questions? Yes, please. Um, hello, just a question to Kenneth, because he, he spoke about Malacca, and uh, Malacca, he, he spoke, uh, he told us about the beautification of the river, and I want to know if this beautification has also some, um, I mean, some views uh, regards the economy, commercial purposes, cultural purposes, or is just beautification, and how the people, local people, what do they feel about this? Is it uh, uh, something uh, that is good for them? So I want to know the effects of this situation. I think when the rejuvenation uh, issue arises, it's always like, as long as it's not my backyard, then it's quite cool about that. Uh, but still, after the beautification, uh, most of the residents are happy because there's no evacuation per se. Uh, and then they got also a free mural painting from the artist that's sponsored by the local government as well. And then those uh, prostitution on the drug addicts is already um, defined other area in a sense. So in, in general, I would say it's quite positive. And um, even the mayor or the civil engineer that involved, they are invited to talk about it in different conferences as well. Um, it is, it's a good, it's a good uh, effort to beautify it, actually. Yeah, and then 
when you have this sort of um, project, then you create some sort of a discussion to pay attention to the river again. Uh, why, why government suddenly uh, pay attention to the river? Uh, it used to be so uh, smelly and dirty. And then in terms of the um, pollution index or the, they call it COD or BOD of that, it's not so um, conducive for human touch as well, right? Human, human contact. But now, uh, it's still not uh, encourageable to swim, but people don't feel kind of um, unapproachable to the riverbank. So you can see the pedestrian and local and tourists walk along the river. Yeah. So the, the river became a public space instead of being a barrier. Okay. Instead of being a segregation, because one set used to be a European, and the other one is um, Chinese, Indian, and Kling settlement. Thank you. Yes, one more question. Um, about uh, the impact and the interface between Singapore and Jora Baru, can you tell us more about it? Do you mean the reclamation? Uh, well, development-wise, river-wise, I mean, front, uh, okay. etc. So whenever Singapore um, <laughs> sort of being not, uh, sort of being nasty in the public media towards Malaysia, Malaysia used to threat Singapore to cut off the water resource at one point. And now we have uh, Forest City, it's a reclaimed island. Uh, and we attract a lot of uh, Chinese investors as well. So we have another island just specifically no, tackle for the Chinese population f come from mainland China. And um, Chinese from mainland China are also very um, witty, per se, because we also have another project in Malacca Gateway. It's also a reclaimed area, whereby it attracts a lot of uh, Chinese investors, the property owner to come in as well. So um, we will only see the impact after a decade. Uh, but for the time being, as a foreign investment, it's a good influx. But in terms of uh, whether the integration and then the social fabrics later on between the mentality of uh, Malaysian Chinese and Chinese from China, then there's another topic, just like Hong Kong, how they opened up the arm from the Melendas to come in uh, two decades ago. Any, any questions, more questions? Well, uh, before uh, then, I think, before we finish, I'd just like to make a comment, uh, which is uh, related to Macau. Well, thank you very much, both of you, to, uh, in reminding us about two things, the history of the rivers, or the river, or the, or the place of the river in history, as well as the, uh, 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 a uh, very important s statement that you made, which is we need to look at the river. Uh, because I think in Macau, we have not paid enough attention to the river on one hand, and that is why, uh, for instance, regarding flooding, uh, we had such big problems all the time and still uh, needs uh, some time to solve those problems. So we have not paid enough attention to the river. The second thing is the history and the importance of the river. For instance, there is nothing about the importance of Inner Harbor in the history of trading between China and the West. And this is really depressing, you know, because sometimes in the past, uh, when I had the opportunity to do so, or when I have the opportunity to do so, I always tell my students, just look at this little piece of river. More than 400 years of trade between the West and China went through this little piece of river. So there's no attention. There's no, nothing written, uh, nothing really promoted in regard to the, to, the, to the place in history that, for instance, the Inner Harbor has in relation to this very, very huge reality, which is the connections and the relationship between the West and uh, China, for instance. So, 
uh, with this uh, final words. Maybe just one remark. Actually, um, I think it's very timely as well. Uh, we, in the urban, urban planning term, we talk a lot about transit-oriented development as long as you allocate the public transportation, MRT, and etc. But we forgot about the discourse about river city, river-based city, whereby you put the river at the first priority first. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and uh, please, Maria, come.